It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. Uh, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting, either at my website, emailrevealer.com, or just email me directly at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Really excited about today's show. We got Nina Burley. Uh, you could find her uh, at her website, ninaburley.com. She's on Twitter and Instagram, also too, at Nina Burley. And it's spelled B U R L E I G H. Uh, written many, many books that are right up our alley. The one we're going to be talking about today is called A Very Private Woman, The Life and Unsolved Murder of Presidential Mistress Mary Meyer. She was a mistress of JFK who was found dead over there in Washington, D.C. Uh, but many other books, The Trump Women, Part of the Deal, uh, one that's coming up right now about the virus, virus vaccines and the CDC and the hijacking of America's response to the pandemic. And of course, if you're not aware of this, that peak series that's out right now, uh, Epstein Shadow, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. She's an executive producer for that, too, as well. Nina Burley, are you there? I am. How are you? I'm good, man. What a what a, a volume of work. You've, you must be working 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're exhausting me as you read it out. But it's been over many years. So. I get a lot of downtime, believe me. Okay, yeah. You, when, from your pictures, you look so young. Too. I, mean, it's, I can't believe you. Ah. <laughs> I'm serious. I can't believe you. Thank you. You compiled all this work. You must be. A, but I know Thank you're. You. I know you're busy, so we won't take up too much of your time. Uh, tell us about yourself before we get into your book, "A Very Private Woman: The Life and Unsolved Murder of Presidential Mistress Mary Meyer." Uh, who is Nina Burley? Well, I was born in the Midwest, and um, I grew up in Chicago, San Francisco. Michigan, um, a little bit in Iraq because my mother was from there, and then um, graduated from high school in suburban Chicago, and um, went to college, got an English degree, came back to Illinois, and started my career in journalism at in Springfield, the state capital, where I learned everything you need to know about corruption and how bureaucracies work because it's a very big state, and um, many many lobbying groups and uh, interests similar to those in Washington, which I then, after some years um, in Chicago and Springfield, moved to D.C. and worked for Time magazine. And while I was there, I, um, I came across this. This was the subject of my first book. I always wanted to write books. I was covering politics, but I always wanted to write books. And I came across this story, um, ben, ben Bradley, the uh, former editor of the Washington Post, and of course the um, editor of the of the um, Watergate uh, investigation, um, was uh, had published a memoir in which he described this very strange uh, incident in his younger years when he had um, a sister-in-law of well, like his second wife, who was um, a mistress to uh, Kennedy. Uh, who turned up dead did I lose you up in Georgetown okay I she, can hear you yeah no yeah no that last she turned up dead where on, on the streets of Georgetown she turned she turned up dead um, she was more basically hit style two bullets um, on the towpath along, along, sort of in Georgetown it's the towpath is like a a park now, a water, a water, an old waterway um, that um, it's a canal basically off the Potomac, and it was it was a big park at the time. It wasn't quite as nice a park. It was sometimes frequented by drunks, and um, and and you know it wasn't fixed up. So mm. uh, she was shot, and on the night of the murder, the in Bradley's memoir, she was going to her art studio. She had a little studio behind her, behind her house. And finding a guy named James Jesus Angleton, who was the CIA's um, counterintelligence chief and a notoriously strange and kind of malicious 
the Cold War history. Um, and he found James Angleton picking the lock to her studio. And he knew James Angleton, Bradley did, because all these, this world at that time, Washington in the late 50s, early 60s, was a world where spies, journalists, political people, diplomats all hung out together and kept each other's secrets often. So in this case, Bradley sees the spook try to break into his sister-in-law's house. He doesn't report it. He just goes in there with him, helps him find what he was looking for, which was her diary, and then lets him take the diary away. And then, you know, a few weeks later, a trial, not months later, a trial, there's a trial of a, of a black guy that they had picked up in the vicinity of the murder scene, and the trial is held, um, and um, he is on basically on trial for not his life because they didn't have the death penalty, but he would have been sent to jail for a long time. In that, Ben Bradley never mentions the interest of the CIA in this thing. He knows this is going on, and. Um, the guy is ultimately acquitted. Now, I read this art. I read this piece in his memoir. It was it was um, excerpted in the in Newsweek, um, and I thought, God, that's weird. Like, first of all, he's the father of Watergate, and um, he didn't he didn't like investigate this or call you know call in his reporters to find out why the super spook was involved in this investigation and what you know what what why did he want the state. And so I asked around in the time office, who is the timer cover all the way back to Kennedy in those days, were the old timers, and they said, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, the Mary Myers story. Yeah, sure, but nobody ever wanted to touch it." I um, at that point had an agent and we were talking and she said oh you should we should pitch this as a book because this is we, we can sell this and um, and so we did we sold it to Random House and um, and then I spent two years investigating looked um, foyering CIA documents and going through interviewing a lot of people in Georgetown who are no longer alive old old grand dames who hung out with Mary Pincho Meyer the woman um, ben Bradley was in his later years. He didn't talk to me, but um, he did. I hear. I heard later he did find the book um, pretty accurate. So I wrote a book, and but, that was my first book, and that's the book that you are uh, talking about. Well, okay, let me before we get into Mary Meyer and who she was and her connection to JFK. Did Ben Bradley ever give a reason why he went over to her apartment that night? Uh, well, his sister, oh, yes, he did, actually. His wife was Mary's sister. And Mary's sister had gotten a call from one of Mary's close friends in, uh, in the art world. And Mary Meyer was, was an artist, among other, other things. And, and the friend had said, you must go over to, to get this diary um, because she would asked me if anything ever happened to me. Please take it. And the diary... Um, probably contains um, information about this long-term affair that she was having with John F. Kennedy. So they were over there looking for the diary, as was the CIA agent. And as soon as he found out that Angleton wanted the, the diary as well, he just said, well, okay, you can have it? Exactly. Okay, that's fascinating. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, then let's get into this. Who is this Mary Pinchot uh, Meyer? Mary Pinchot Meyer was a, um, an American beauty and an American aristocrat. Her family, longtime Americans, um, her uh, high-level uh, high um, political people from Pennsylvania, the Pinchot family, um, was, um, you can see the name, the Pinchot National Forest. If you go to, like, I think it's in um, uh, Washington State or Oregon, um, they were, her, her granddaddy or great uncle was the um, first uh, secretary of the interior under Teddy Roosevelt. She had a governor of Pennsylvania in her family, I think. Some other, you know, people who were very prominent in sort of liberal American history, and they were very wealthy. She married Cord Meyer. Um, Cord Meyer also from a very wealthy American family, but more like Long Island, New York. 
and they were American aristocrats. You know, they went to Yale. The husband went to Yale, or they all, you know, they all hung out together. She was a debutante. Um, in the tw- she was born in 1920, like you know, very close to the same age as John F. Kennedy, and her husband. Cordmeyer, like Kennedy, was a World War II uh, veteran, and her husband actually had lost an eye in the Pacific Theater, so he wore an eye patch. And Cordmeyer um, joined the CIA right out of, well, he came home from the war, married Mary, and then what got very involved in what at the time was called One World Government. And he was pu- pushing for some kind of a one-world government. And the reason is that after the um, bo- atom bomb was dropped in, in, you know, ending World War II, a lot of these American, um, let's say the intelligentsia or people in the political world, were very alarmed that this, you know, this, the, the humanity had this, this ability to have these incredibly powerful weapons. So he was a very young idealist, and he, first of all, was working for one world government, which now, of course, would would just set people off. Mm. It, you know, it's the, it's the UN. Anyway, he did not He did that for a while, and then he got involved in helping set up the UN, which the United they were setting up the United Nations. I mean, it had been started by World War II, so they started League of Nations. They were, they were setting up the United Nations, and then he was recruited by Alan Dulles to the CIA. And... Um, so he was like the he, he rose because the CIA at the time was completely off the books. It was a new agency after World War II. It didn't exist before World War II. They operated off the books. They didn't. Congress did not have an open budget for them, and they were super secretive operation. The people who worked there, the parent, the children and spouses, thought they worked at the U.S. Post Office. That's how secretive it was. And Cordmeyer um, ranked number three in the CIA so he was high level and his job was sort of like infiltrating intelligentsia or labor unions and and like intellectual um like but the book publishers and so he was very much involved in like the misinformation disinformation campaigns that were you know part of the 50s operations mostly in Europe because they didn't want the communism to spread in places like Italy, which was really close to going communist. So he spent a lot of time like paying off labor union leaders in Europe and so on. And over time, his the couple kind of grew apart. He became more and more hawkish and more like pro, you know, Vietnam War was starting. And um, he also had a lot of personal animosity with Kennedy. For various reasons, and meanwhile, she got close to Kennedy and was one of his. Kennedy, you know, had girlfriends coming in and out of the White House every day, like interns and things. But she, she was somebody who he had because they were sort of equal. She was hanging out with him in the Oval Office, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis. She was in there whenever Jackie was out of town. We could see in the in the um, White House logs that she was being invited in and just hanging out with them. So she was basically a girlfriend, but also like kind of a buddy and she was inside his inner circle so fast forward you know kennedy um assassinated and warren commission report um investigates and um you know what the end of that is and then and 10 days later oh and she had divorced cord meyer before kennedy was assassinated they, they've been divorced for some years um, wait, wait, but, but let me let me interrupt for a second. But but she was dating Kennedy while she was married to Cord Meyer. Well, it's not. I mean, I'm not. They knew each other since college, and they were like, you know, he had a big crush on her apparently for years. Now, was he was she having an affair with him while she was married to Cord Meyer? I don't know. I can't remember if it, it was over. It, it coincided. Their their marriage was not falling apart because of. Kennedy. Okay. They fell apart over other things. They, a child. They had a child who died uh, tragically in a car accident, and they that started. And then they she, they were going moving apart anyway because he was becoming more and more conservative, and she was becoming more and more liberal. And in fact, so liberal that she was doing things like dropping LSD with Timothy Leary, right. and enter, and hanging out with the you know the New York um, like abstract art world. Right, and, wait, wait, um, some people say that she's the one who gave LSD to JFK. 
Uh, yeah, that's something that is speculated on. They they speculate that he she brought pot into the White House. Um, that's been reported by people who knew her. The the LSD connection. The only um, evidence that we have of her doing this was Timothy Leary himself telling later telling the story of her showing up at his office, at Harvard, and saying, "I want some of this drug." Um, or no, trying it with him and then saying, I want to bring some down to Washington to share with powerful men mm. in the middle of the Cold War and, you know, to turn them on to world peace. And so there's a one element, this, this her murder, which, by the way, never solved because the, the accused was, was acquitted. And we can talk about that in a bit. Her murder is one of the in, most enduring um, conspiracy theories of, Yeah, and because of the LSD connection, and because of the Kennedy connection, there's endless speculation. And one of those conspiracy theories is, oh, she did LSD with the president. She turned him on to, to LSD, and he became more interested in world peace, and then was ready to like make rapprochement with Khrushchev, and with Cuba, and that he had to die because the military industrial were like, no, no, you can't do this. So that's one of the big enduring conspiracy theories. Whether he actually did LSD with her, I cannot answer. I, I don't think we have evidence of that. What we do have is I interviewed Timothy Leary right before he died in L.A. That's when I was writing the book. Hmm. And he was dying of prostate cancer. And he stood by his story that she, you know, did it with him and told him she wanted to bring some down to Washington. Um, but he doesn't know that she dropped acid with with Kennedy. Nobody, you know, nobody has actually ever come forward with any kind of convincing proof. I think one one writer did write a book, some, some maybe it was about Angleton or something, where he he claimed that he got Cord Meyer to tell him that or something. But there's no there's no evidence. But you, you can only speculate. Gotcha. But the story that. the story's out there. It's just one of those stories. It story. absolutely yeah. is one of the many, many stories about her and the whole, um, you know, as I said, enduring mystery because she come, this murder happens at the very early stages of the kind of national security state world of secrets that we live in now. Like they were just right. starting to create this absolute web of secrecy. And there were a lot of nefarious things going on. In the in the fifties, really bad stuff that, that en ended up being revealed by the Church Committee, where they were you know assassinating this person and that you know in Africa, and they were doing bad things in the in Central America, and they tried in you know dozens of ways to assassinate Castro, and um, they were spying on Americans, and that eventually was what got them into trouble. Be and Cord Myers particularly because they were infiltrating student anti-war um, operations in the 60s, and he got caught at that. Um, but that was much later after she died. But the, but the main thing is that there, there were a lot of secrets and um, a lot of nefarious things were going on, malignant stuff happening worldwide that were orchestrated by these guys in the center of power in Washington. And at that center of power included Ben Bradley and included diplomats and political people who had a very different attitude about what was meant to be public than we do now. So, like, the journalists who hung out with a CIA officer, of, you know, Angleton or Kennedy, and Ben Bradley's very close to Kennedy, um, would never put in the paper, like, oh, by the way, Kennedy's a sex addict and interns mm -hmm. are coming in and out of, you know, they never would have reported on that ever and that they wouldn't have, that's why you know because they were tr they were kind of coming out of world war ii and they fe all felt like they were in this you know patriotic duty together in that you know creating the american century and the empire and keeping communism at bay they were all on the same side much different than now where you have you know obviously not nobody's going to keep those types of secrets if they can scoop it they'll put it in the paper then what do you make of this this story then? If, if Ben Bradley, if his mission is to go over there and get this diary in order to uh, get her story out, you know, her final death wish, uh, and then he so quickly gives it up uh, to the person who he must have known at that time was part of uh, keeping the story quiet, um, what do you think his motive was in that situation? Just fear or cowardice? No, it was family propriety. Okay. Absolutely. You know, first of all, Kennedy 
you know, he was a friend. And as I said, he was not ever going to reveal that Kennedy was having, you know, being, being um, as much of a hound dog right. as he was. The never That was never going to happen. And he wasn't over there getting the diary because he wanted to reveal it. He was getting it because his, his wife said, we need to get this thing and get it out of view of public eye gotcha. before it be found because it's our family and we don't want her memory be smirched with this story. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Now it's fascinating because so many of the names you mentioned, you know, we've actually, we've done shows about them. We've had guests on the show. Some, some, even some of these assassins you mentioned, some of these assassinations we've had them, you know, they're, they're relatives and their family on the show. Uh, but I, and I've heard this story about Mary Meyer and the, the alleged LSE passing, but I've never heard about her murder. No one's ever said to me, oh, by the way, she was murdered in this park, uh, two bullets. Well, you know, did you say two bullets to the back of the head? Uh, no, they weren't to the back of the head. It was, um, I think, one to the head and one to, right into the um, the chest or something. I, I can't. There were two, and they they were pretty, um, you know, pretty well aimed. Um, now she was overpowered by this whoever the uh, assailant was and grabbed, and they uh, they even had an eyewitness looking down hearing the screams because the, the the towpath is below the level of the street up in Georgetown. So people could, somebody heard it and looked over and saw, claimed to have seen, you know, the struggle or heard the screaming and saw a man standing over and heard shots and saw a man standing over her body. And mm-hmm. he, he, the, the witness was black, a black mechanic. And the, um, he identified a black man as the killer. And so that's that was the evidence that that and you know they never found the murder weapon. Um, they picked up this guy um, who had been released from the drunk tank recently, and he was like a kind of vagrant um, who had you know alcohol issues, and um, they put him on trial. They they blamed him. He he lied or you know told them that he was swimming fishing, and that's what he was doing down there was fishing. But he had been in the water. Um, he was soaking wet. I think he had taken his shirt off. I can't remember. And that so there was like a. It was he behaved suspiciously. Um, and his story was, you know, I was fishing. But there, his fishing pole they found at home. Like he wasn't actually out there fishing. What he was doing, nobody knows. Um, but he did get himself acquitted. Um, interestingly, and there, in comes another interesting character to the story. A um, black female defense attorney in uh, Washington. Pretty rare cat. Like in those years that you would even have black people had to use separate bathrooms and stuff in public Mm. places down there. And she was a um, uh, a very interesting woman. She was also a um, a preacher. It's like she, on Sundays she was a member of the church and she had gotten herself up into this level of where she could give, give fun sermons. Um, so she was a lawyer, a uh, defense lawyer, and the mother of the accused um, knew her from church and said, will you help me? And so her name was Debbie Roundtree, and she I also interviewed her. She lived a long life. She only recently died. Um, she um, took the case <clears throat> and um, against a lot of odds, including, you know, kind of death threats, really, um, to her. She And also, like, not being able to take buses across town and stuff to go interview people on the white, rich side of town. She managed to um, win the case based on um, the eyewitness uh, descriptions of the guy. He was very tiny. It's almost like the O.J. Simpson glove thing. Mm. He was a very short man. And she um, managed to really take a witness down on, well, you said he was this size, but look, he's very small. And he could barely as tall as, as she was. And, um, and so there was that. And then there was the, where was no murder weapon. And so she had that going for her. And then um, they added in a character. The government put on, on the stand uh, a military guy who had been supposedly jogging along the path um, right before the murder happened. And he was this mysterious figure who, who would testify at the trial and say, yeah, I saw, I saw the, 
defendant. I saw Mary Meyer on the path, and I saw the defendant in, you know, in the vicinity of where the shots were fired. And then uh, many years went by with people trying to figure out, like, who was this guy, the jogger? Like, why was he, you know, what, he had a very, very common name, like Bill Smith or something. And they just had, you know, many, many conspiracy hunters and to find him. And um, he was a Pentagon guy and, you know, maybe even like a CIA-related character. He, he was kind of a mysterious guy. But the, he was eventually found and he stuck to his story. Um, but so there, she threw in some, that, some doubt and, um, and the jury was, was pretty much all, not all black, but it was pretty black. And it was after the, now this is 1965, and it was after Watts was burning. So there's like a lot of civil unrest, civil rights stuff going on. Um, and she won an acquittal for him. And, and by the way, it's quite interesting. The timing of the whole thing is very, there's a lot of racial politics because 1964, when she was murdered, of course, is also the year of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was passed by Johnson and the Congress after Kennedy's death. So that Civil Rights Act, um, you know, was a seminal moment in, in race relations in the U.S. And, there, and then there was this, you know, urban unrest in places like Watts. And there was, you know, so, that, so there was a kind of an emboldened, a sense of emboldened, I guess, you know, response to the by the black community to what was going on in, you know, these, the, you know, these, these bureaucracies of white people. And they, they sort of took, you know, they took and ran with that too, I think. So they acquitted Ray Crump, that was his name. And um, so meaning that this is an unsolved murder. She was definitely murdered, but what, who did it is not clear. You know, I'm unclear about one thing that she was murdered, murdered in 1964. Yes. Now, was this before or after the Kennedy assassination? It was 10 days after the Warren Commission report came out. Uh, okay, so, gotcha. Yes, much after. Gotcha. You gotcha. Know, and the conspiracy theories have to do with the fact that the Warren Commission report was not um, forthcoming with the truth and that she had to die. That's part of the conspiracy theory. She had to die because ten, you know, the commission came out with this explanation of one man killing Kennedy and that, you know, she's among these people that, I mean, again, conspiracy theorists, that she was somehow privy to, uh, privy to other information that would have contradicted the Warren Commission report, which they absolutely couldn't have out. Gotcha. Okay, so then the theory is that the information she had in her diary was more about the assassination rather than her, or, her or affair. Or no, not in her, or in her head, or okay. just in her head, that she knew stuff. Gotcha. You know? Oof, yeah, that's, that's, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that uh, at all. But I, that's, those are the, those are the conspiracy theories, and the fact that there is still, to this day, a lot of unanswered questions about the Kennedy assassination brings everything to do with it, including this woman's death, into the mystery. Column. Okay, but then if you spent, you know, this is your first book, you spent, and it's 20 years ago, you spent 20 years thinking about this book and this story, you tuned into it. What is your belief then? Well, I think most of the evidence that I looked at were pointed to the guy being, Ray Crump, being capable of doing this. Hmm. Um, we, we tracked him down. He had been in, in and out of prison after that, including for things like arson and rape. So he went on to a life of pretend, a violent crime. And I, I met an ex-wife who had a uh, knife scar on her neck, that she said it was from him. And he, would, he was still alive. He refused to talk to me. Um, he's gone now. But uh, he lived a life of intermittent violence that belied the story of he's just this little man who's not doing anything wrong. So to me, it may it seemed possible that he could have been just you know out there and saw, seen this beautiful woman walking by and killing her. Where he got the gun, don't know. Hard to tell. And how he aimed so you know 
so uh, accurately. I mean, over time, I've thought about that, and I, I don't know. Um, and um, you know, with the re- reveals on Kennedy's assassination, they're trickling out so slowly. But I have friends who are researching, who still research it, and you know, it's not clear that that there wasn't a conspiracy to kill him. It, it you know, that that that, that Oswald maybe wasn't. Hmm. One or that they, the CIA had enormous interest in Oswald for, for years before this happened. Um, they were opening his mother's mail and stuff. They were interested in him. The Mexico bureau chief of the CIA was into him, was connecting with him. So, you know, again, this is like, and then you had the Cuban emigrants uh, who were super pissed at Kennedy. You had the mafia down there, and they were all mobbed up with the Cubans. So, and they hated uh, Kennedy. So I don't know, you know, that you can say that he was, that you know, anybody can say with certainty that it was just Oswald and that there wasn't some kind of a bigger conspiracy. And certainly his death changed the course of the country and the spirit of the country to be more um, abject to the national security state that we live under now. Absolutely. Now, now this fellow that was arrested for this crime, he said his name was Ray Kroc. Crump. Crump. Ray Crump. Yeah. Okay, and, yeah. and you also said that he had just been released from the drunk tank prior to this uh, this shooting. Yes. within He had been in, the, in jail within some days or hours of being out there on the towpath. So then it, it wouldn't be much of a CIA operation or an intelligence operation for people at this level. You know, the, the third highest man in the CIA is a... Um, right. Right. <laughs> at this level. Uh, to, to have a guy released from the drunk tank, you know, you pick him up. Hey, here's a, here's a bottle of wine. Let's take a walk down to the park. Hey, hey hold this for a second. You know you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's the... That's, the, um, that's not a big job. Yeah. Uh, that's, no, it's not a big deal. And, you know, like, again, people would say, always ask me, like, well, who do you think did it? Yeah. If you read the book, you'll see that my instincts were go with the Occam's razor. Like the guy they picked up, you know, he was he was capable of violence afterwards, and he was on the scene. Um, but uh, if I was to you know make percentages about like the possibilities or who's who done it, I would say likely him. Second likeliest would be her husband, mm. um, who was really pissed. Um, a- angry about you know her relationship with Kennedy, jealous, a jealous man known to be you know kind of a you know people we interviewed he he was capable of rages and tempers and stuff. Um, would he have been able to say I want to kill my ex because of this? And then and then or you know and or was he just privy to the information that like Angleton and these other people were you know, decided that she had to go because she knew something. She knew, you know, it's always like, well, she knew something. But then, mm. then I get back to like, well, what would she know? Because she was, in my research into her, she wasn't super political. She was kind of a socialite. She was in, she had, you know, some li- liberal leanings, some progressive leanings, but she wasn't necessarily somebody who would have been informed of let's say the CIA a plot, but maybe, you know, maybe she would have gotten some wind of that through some means. Um, I don't know. So big question mark over the whole thing. Uh, we're talking today to Nina Burley. Uh, uh, Nina, it's spelled the B U R L E I G H, Nina Burley.com. Uh, you could find her again on Instagram and Twitter at Nina Burley. Now, the book we've been talking about is A Very Private Woman The Life and Unsolved Murder of Presidential Mistress Mary Meyer. And, and like I said, we've been talking, we, we've discussed this topic before, but never from this sober point of view uh, from someone who's written a book on this 20 years ago before podcasts came along. <laughs> before YouTube came along and uh, you know a Washington insider of sorts uh, executive producer of Epstein's shadow Ghislaine Maxwell and also uh, the Trump the women uh, part of the deal I'd love to have you come back uh, talk about tr- the Trump book uh, 
Nina, you, you described uh, Mary Meyer as a socialite. Now, you just did this project on Ghislaine Maxwell. A lot of people would describe her, too, as just a socialite. Uh, but yet she had this intelligence background. Her father was this notorious intelligence agent. She, she was involved with Epstein that a lot of people uh, speculate had all kind of intelligence ties. Uh, what about uh, Mary Meyer in her personal life before being, besides being married into the CIA? That what is any kind of uh, background herself? Uh, uh, Mary Meyer? Yeah. Or Ghislaine? I'm no. sorry, you, you asked about Ghislaine first, I wasn't sure. You want to talk about Mary Meyer? Well, yeah, I was comparing Mary Meyer to Ghislaine, because okay. a lot of people will say sorry. Ghislaine yeah. was just a, a, a socialite. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, very different, um, though, very different. Okay. So, Ghislaine Maxwell is a um, the daughter of an actual spook who worked, I mean, he was many things, Robert Maxwell, a criminal and a, um, a, 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 ty- a, ty- a, ty- a tycoon, um, and a global um, global tycoon um, with um, with ties to the KGB and the Mossad. Um, Mary, uh, not the same. Mary Meyer is an American aristocrat from you know very American, not global. It's a, not somebody whose family was already in international intrigue. Um, so uh, not you know married a man who did become a high ranking member of the CIA. So, but not 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 like Elaine Maxwell, who was actually. I mean, it, it, the the, the, compar- the comparable thing would be that they both moved in, you know, in circles of men, powerful men who and uh, who had um, you know lots of secrets. That's the that's what would be sort of similar. I mean, you know, Epstein. Is criminal and and Epstein's uh, doings and involvements with people like, you know, the Apollo. Uh, what's his name? Um, oh, come on, Leon Black or you know gotcha. Bill Gates, uh, Bill Clinton. Um, you know, uh, various men that he um, interacted with um, socially, and you know, who knew maybe that he had uh, girls around. Um, trafficking was happening um, around them. Um, that's a different beast altogether. Um, we think that we think that Epstein and Elaine were involved in a kind of a blackmail op, like a factory mm. of blackmail or influence operation. And that, you know, we have CIA, ex-CIA and ex-Mossad on the show saying, you know, Epstein, this, this, what he was doing with this looks like an intelligence operation, looks like an influence op. Uh, you know, did, he, he did was you have collecting, was blackmailing it, people. Was it Ari, Ari Ben Banashi? Yes, it was. Okay, I figured, yeah. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> I mean, for the most, on the Mossad side, but yeah. not on the CIA. We had other, we have CIA, ex CIA agents on the show um, talking about this. So it's not just Ari, because Ari, you know, we, he's got issues. Who did you have from the CIA? Uh, Valerie Plain and okay. John Kiriakou. Oh, very nice. I've had John on the show several times. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, uh, what else will, are we going to find? I, I haven't seen this uh, documentary yet, uh, Epstein's Shadow, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. What else are we going to find on there? Well, I'm not going to give it away. You've got to go watch it, man. <laughs> it's got great stuff in it. When I mean, is it coming out? You know, I'll just, it's been out since June of last year. Okay. It's a three part documentary, and we're, we're doing a fourth on, um, uh, I don't know if I can say it, but a fourth segment will come out in the fall. Uh, but, the, but the first three se- segments are out. They've been out since June of 21. Go on Peacock, you can watch it. And um, yeah, we got all sorts of new stuff because what we were doing was so the Netflix series on, um, on, on Epstein called, I think, Filthy Rich, mm. focuses on the victims or the girls who were being trafficked. And we, we learn who they are and what happened to them and how awful it was. We went in there with two aims. Who is Ghislaine Maxwell and what is she doing getting involved in it? And secondly, what, what is the thing that they were doing? What is it? Not, not like, you know, why were they doing this? Not, you know, who are the victims and what happened to them, but what was this operation? Why were they doing it? 
the why of it. Why were they bringing in two or three girls a day sometimes mm. to give him sexualized massages? Well, does, does, does Jeffrey Epstein look like he has those carnal desires that required three different girls a day? Does that, is that something that was really going on? Or was they, were they grooming them using this man as like the model for grooming girls that they could then send out to a Prince Andrew or, you know, according to the documents in the defamation case, there were like Bill, uh, Bill Richardson and, and George Mitchell. Again, those guys deny that they're named in the documents and there are dozens of male names that are that are redacted in documents and they're redacted because the guys are so powerful they call them the John Doe cases the John Doe's have, caught, have gotten into the, these lawsuits and said you keep my name out mm -hmm. and they've managed to do that for years and years and years and you, see, you can't tell who they all are but we know from the ones that have been mentioned that it looks like Epstein's, they targeted people who had certain types of influence and access that they wanted to affect. What about, uh, I know too, uh, we were, you were supposed to come on and talk about this book, uh, Trump, the Women Part of the Deal. We've only got a couple of minutes left, okay? But uh, uh, now you describe women that he had positive relationships with as well? Yeah, it's it's just, it's called The Trump Women Part of the Deal. And it's it's a, researched our uh, book about the six women closest to Donald Trump. His mother, his grandmother, okay, German immigrant grandmother, Scottish immigrant mother, three wives, Ivana, who just died, Czech immigrant, Marla Maples, who's from Georgia, Melania, who is from Slovenia, another immigrant, and then his daughter, Ivanka. So, it's really the stories of these four women and how they mm. shaped his attitudes towards women and how he treated them and who they are. Um, and then there's a final little chapter that sort of throw in all the, you know, there are 20 or 25, 24 women who've accused him of sexual misconduct up to rape. So there's that in there. And his sister also I get into. His sister's mm. quite interesting. The, what about, what about Tiffany? Judge. Tiffany Shrum. Uh, not, not, well, I mean, I mentioned her on Passant, but she's not important. I mean, he saw her like twice. Yeah, I know. Before, she, before he was president. Yeah. Before he started running for president, she, he saw her like maybe twice in life or, yeah. you know, after they divorced. She, she showed up at, at the, uh, for the campaign and became part of a club of siblings then. Now, um, real quick, because we are out of time, uh, what, what, what do you make of this, um, that, uh, Ivana was buried at Mar-a-Lago? I'm sure they're at a Bedminster. Oh, okay. Yeah. What do you make of that? On the golf course. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if people were calling me right away. Oh, he pushed you down the stairs. <laughs> oh, we yeah, didn't want to testify. And they had to bury it, at, you know, bury it at, <laughs> uh, bed, at, you know, at the, in the golf course so she can never be exhumed. And yeah, I'm writing a piece for New York Magazine about this, and all your your readers can see it in a couple of weeks. Um, so you'll know more then. But I'm I'm investigating it. Let's just say that. Well, hopefully we can have you come back when, when that comes out, and we can talk Happy more. To. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed this and a very uh, interesting story that I can't believe I've never heard this story before. A very private woman, the life and unsolved murder of presidential mistress Mary Meyer. We've been talking to Nina Burleigh. Uh, that's B U R L E I G H. She's on. Uh, Twitter. Uh, you can find her on Instagram, uh, ninaberlay.com. Uh, these other books, uh, The Trump Women, Part of the Deal, and uh, this documentary that's on Peacock that she doesn't want to tip us off on. <laughs> you got to go watch it. We are not going to get any inside secrets on that, but we can find out where it is. It's Epstein's Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, Nina, thank you so much. You're welcome, and thank you. Take care. Good night. Bye.